Hello folks, Professor Bannock here and welcome back. It's great to see you all for our next installment in our investigation of Wittgenstein's Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. Today we move into propositions four and five. Lots of really tough stuff going on here. Lots of dense logical frameworks that Wittgenstein is putting out. We want to take you through some of the most important things that are being said in four and five. We can't take you through every single thing, but we can show you the peaks and valleys, what's making Wittgenstein's discussion here so significant in terms of our understanding of logic, philosophy, and science, and indeed of language. So far, the flow of the Tractatus has been like such. We started out in metaphysics and ontology talking about what the world is, what the world consists of. We then moved into how we mean the world, the understanding of meaning as mimesis or picturing the world. And then we move now into the conception of how language and meaning interact. That is to say, what is the nature of language? And Wittgenstein's discussion here is not only important for the very nature of language, but more, more fruitfully, the very understanding of philosophy and its limits. And in particular, as we get into the weeds on propositions four and five, the important thing to look out for here is Wittgenstein's truth functional account of propositions, that is to say, a proposition is a truth function. We'll see what that means as we go. And perhaps most importantly, Wittgenstein's account of necessity that falls out of this. He's going to have a very distinctive account of necessity that narrows the range of what philosophy will be capable of doing. Wittgenstein's proposition four is as follows. A thought is a proposition with a sense. So connecting together his previous discussion of the notion of meaning with the notion of thought in the idea of a proposition. A thought is a proposition that can be assigned a determinate meaning. Since for Wittgenstein a meaning is a picture, that is the presence of a pictorial form, or a structure that mirrors or is, has an isomorphism to another structure, a fact that mimics another fact, a proposition is going to be a picture of reality. That is, going, that is to say, a proposition is going to be a fact that pictures other facts. So since we know a thought is a proposition with a sense, with a meaning, we know that a proposition is a picture of reality. That is to say that we're going to assign the meaning of the proposition by looking for the fact which, whose structure the proposition mirrors. So the sense of a proposition is always just the fact whose structure that proposition mirrors. Why does Wittgenstein think he's entitled to the idea that a proposition, a piece of language, is a picture of reality? In the last video, we talked about how this forms a picture because there's a spatial configuration such that the spatial configuration between the elements of the picture matches somehow the spatial configuration of the world. So this is a picture of a human face. It has a meaning because of that spatial isomorphism. But it's less clear on the face of it, no pun intended, how a linguistic proposition is going to picture reality. Wittgenstein gives a kind of transcendental argument for this here. And his meditations on this topic center around the observation that human beings are capable of encountering new propositions and knowing the meaning of them, even though that new proposition is one that they had never encountered before. Wittgenstein insists that the only way this is possible is because we know the meanings of the constituents of the proposition. So the meaning of a proposition must be determined by the meaning of its constituents. Another way to say this is the meaning of the whole proposition must be a function of the meaning of its parts. So the argument here is essentially this. Look, we are capable of grasping the meaning of a novel proposition. If propositions weren't pictures of reality, if they didn't show what they said, then we would not be able to grasp the meaning of novel propositions. Therefore, propositions are pictures of reality. This leads Wittgenstein into building into his conception of proposition a very important property that is popularly known as compositionality. That's what Wittgenstein is getting at in 4.024 when he says to, to understand a proposition means to know what is the case if that proposition is true. It is understood by anyone who understands its constituents. That is to say, understanding a proposition requires nothing more than understanding the parts that enter into it. 
By understanding the parts, we can then understand the whole. So compositionality is the idea in logic that the meaning of a whole proposition is a function of the meaning of its parts. So if we could get the meaning of the parts down, then we're able to get the meaning of the whole simply by putting those parts together in a determinate way. Now, the other component of 4.024, he's using his doctrine that the sense or the meaning of a proposition is just its truth conditions. So what 4.024 is, is driving towards is the idea that no matter what, how complex a proposition, its meaning is simply its truth conditions, and its truth conditions are given by the truth conditions of its simpler components put together in particular ways. This is Wittgenstein working towards the truth functional account of propositions. As Wittgenstein moves on to say in 4.0312, my fundamental idea is that the logical constants are not representatives, that there can be no representatives of the logical facts. It is only insofar as a proposition is logically articulated that it is a picture of a situation. So in addition to compositionality, Wittgenstein is also claiming that there's something important about the nature of logical constants. These are words like and, not, if, then, or, or. In order to suppose that propositions can picture reality, we need to divide the constituents of propositions up into two categories. One are words that have the representational power. They can actually be uh, they can actually correspond to things in the world like red, ball, tall. These words correspond to things in the world, whereas the logical constants, words like and, not, if, then, or, or, these don't stand in for any kind of like magical universal object called and, or some magical universal object called negation. These are simply rules for taking words like the, the top ones and putting them together to form new propositions. Here's an analogy. Take my arm as an example. Now we could say that my arm is composed of two parts, the forearm and the upper arm. And here there's a bend, right? And this is, what lo this is a lot like what Wittgenstein would call logical articulation. Really there's just the forearm and the upper arm and the way that, and the bend is not a thing by itself but just a way of putting the forearm and the upper arm together. There's no bend in reality here. There's just a forearm, an upper arm, and then a way that they're put together. In 4.121, Wittgenstein gives an important proposition that we'll need to keep in mind for later on when he comes to the, late, to the end of the limits of what can be put into language. Here he says, propositions cannot represent logical form. Logical form is mirrored in the propositions, and he goes on. The idea here is that we, if we wanted to put logical form into language, we would have to use language which already is using the logical form. The logical form is simply something that has to be shown through the construction of our propositions. It cannot be put into a proposition because the proposition is already made out of that logical form. It's kind of like this. Suppose you had a cake, all baked nicely, and someone said, hey, show me the ingredients of this cake. How was this cake put together? Well, the best you could do here is to pull out the eggs, pull out the flour, pull out the sugar, pull out the vanilla, and so on, and kind of mimic how you made the cake for the person. Now, suppose you showed the person the ingredients of the cake, and they said, I don't see how those ingredients come together to make a cake. Well, there's no one ingredient that you could pull out of the fridge and say, here's how we put all these together. It just doesn't make any sense. You would just have to show the person how you put eggs and flour and sugar together to make a cake. And the best way to explain that to a person would just be to show them the basic ingredients and show them how they're put together. We couldn't come up with an ingredient that shows the way all of the cake ingredients are put together just have to separate it out into its ingredients and do the activity of putting them together. And in that activity, the cake will, will form. Similarly here, we cannot set aside a proposition that shows the form of propositions. Just like we can't then pull out an ingredient out of the refrigerator and call the form of the cake, we can't put, cook up a proposition that would tell us the form of propositions. We simply have to show 
the form by doing the thing of putting the propositions together.